Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. This is your host, Howard Fox. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, and enjoyment of the great outdoors. Our guest today is Paul Seaswarda. Paul is the executive director of Gotham Whale, a 501c3 organization whose mission is the study, education, and advocacy for the marine mammals around New York City. Paul is also the author of Big Whale, Big City, an illustrated children's book that tells the story of a humpback whale named Jerry, whose journey to New York City parallels the story of humpbacks that are returning to the New York City area. Paul, welcome to the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Thank you very much, Howard. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. And, and right away, two things that jump right out for me, Paul. I love your background and I'm envious because I have never seen a whale. Oh, <laughs> you have to uh, come whale watching with us. Well, you know something? Be careful what you offer because I'm going to take advantage of that. And you also have some nice swag or merch as it's now. I love that shirt. Uh, oh, Gotham thank Whale. you so much. Thank you. We think we have a very outstanding uh, logo that really represents both whales and the, the juxtaposition of whales and the big city. So can't go wrong with that. I love the, how the, you know, the city architecture is with it incorporated within the whale tail. That's fantastic. Exactly. Great and, job. And, and by the way, I do have to thank you too. I noticed when I was looking at the merch page on the website, you actually go into the three XL and four XL for the long sleeve shirts. <laughs> we aim to please everyone. Uh, uh, I can't we should, tell we you. should, we should call those the whale category. There, there you go. You know, something <laughs> that, I think we're going to try to share some of the video for, uh, today's episode by the, you have a nice cup there as well. I, there's definitely this thank whale you. theme going along. Thank you so much. And I can't tell you how many outdoor adventure sites, you know, products that have, uh, clothing, they don't get into the three X or four X and I'm a three X kind of guy right now. You know, I need to lose some weight, but I'm a, but, uh, so I appreciate <laughs> that you did that. Good for you. Well, listen, let's get into a little bit about your background, just to kind of give our listeners a foundation of, you know, who is Paul C's word up. I mean, you have had an extensive background working in some very famous uh, aquariums up in the Northeast, and then then we'll kind of dive into the book, okay? Sure thing. So, so share I, a little bit. Okay. I was um, literally struck by the excitement and the adventure that was happening in the uh, late 60s, uh, mainly through Jacques Cousteau. Uh, he really, really influenced me to uh, be part of the adventures of uh, exploration under the sea. Um, there was, at that particular time, there was a lot of um, exploration going to the moon and also underwater. Um, so it was a time of excitement of exploration and looking at new frontiers as I say, both into the sky and under the waves. So it was uh, something that struck me. I had uh, been an English major, uh, which uh, I must say served me in this career uh, in various places, but um, suddenly I wanted to be involved in the ocean. And at that time, there was a lot of um, uh, technical applications, uh, <clears throat> companies like Raytheon and big, uh, companies were having developing ocean systems division. So I thought my way into that field might be, uh, through engineering. Uh, however, I took some courses at, uh, MIT nights and they were the same courses during the day. And I found that had <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> advanced math and the things that were needed, uh, were not my style, so to speak, or forte. And so what was really, really 
terrific was that um, the New England Aquarium was just being developed, just being built on the waterfront of Boston in 1969. And I was able to get my foot in the door as a volunteer. And um, uh, I was able to work my way up into um, a position of curator uh, over a number of years. I always say skyrocketed to the middle after, after <laughs> uh, almost 20 years. But um, it's been a wonderful experience and it really did fulfill all of my um, dreams of kind of being uh, in the footsteps of, uh, of Jacques Cousteau. Uh, I've been diving in uh, many of the oceans around the world and seen uh, some really amazing things. You know, I really, I love that story, Paul. And I, I grew up with Jacques, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau and I, I, I can't remember the day of the week that it was on. I want to say it was Sunday. I could be right. It could be wrong, but right. what a wonderful show. And, and I think, you know, for many of us, and especially yourself, you know, some show like that with the information they're providing, you know, the fact that it could spark you in, into a career. This is amazing. Absolutely. It was absolutely no question that that was the driving force for me personally, and uh, uh, it was, uh, like I said, led to a lot of great adventures and some uh, activities that that the aquarium field made available for me. Okay. Now, you went on to also uh, curate at the New York Aquarium as well? That's correct. Um, that was uh, another uh, experience um, that uh, brought... Um, my involvement in this same field in, in a different area. And it brought me to the big city of New York. Uh, I was, the aquarium is part of, uh, a very large organization now called the, uh, wildlife conservation society. It used to be the New York zoological society. And, um, it not only is the Bronx zoo, the central park zoo, prospect park zoo, the aquarium, but it also has, uh, projects all over the world. And so, uh, that gave me a vision of, um, what a major zoological institution was like. Wow. And I can only imagine, I mean, you were hard at work, but you're also in the middle of a, you know, a, I want to say a candy store that doesn't seem appropriate, but you're in the middle of a, this no. wonderful place of where you, your imagination could go wild. For me, the candy store analogy <laughs> it really fits because, uh, right now I've been, and this is all since my retirement that I have been active with whales, um, throughout my experience in the aquariums, one of the first things that I was involved with was the pioneering of, uh, raising larval fish up to adults. And the real, the real trick in that was to, uh, provide a, a first food for them because they're so small, they need microscopic, uh, food organisms and those food organisms had to be alive. So the culture of algae to feed the rotifers, to feed the larval fish, all of that was just being developed. And I had a, um, hand in the beginning stages of that. So that was exciting. And then, then there was some advances in, uh, systems for keeping aquariums, the circulation systems, the filtration systems, uh, various treatments like ozone, applying ozone to the water, to clean the water, make the environment good for the animals that we were keeping. And so all of those were areas of, um, that were cutting edge at the time. And so I seem to be drawn to something that's brand new. When the work gets kind of routine, I may drift away a little bit, but at the, <laughs> when it's new and exciting, um, count me in. I, I love that. I love that. And I mean, there's nothing worse that I think than being 
at a job, a J-O-B that we're not uh, happy about or we're bored with because that only affects yourself and affects the people around you and the company. And here you are at the forefront of a lot of major change and innovation. And what a great career. What a great career. Well, it's been a lot of fun. I was able to include my sons um, on some of these adventures and uh, that made it even uh, more special. Fantastic. Now, when you left the, the aquariums, you went on to uh, found uh, Gotham Whale, uh, the 501c3. Tell us more about that organization and the work you're doing there. Sure. It, um, Gotham Whale is a model on a number of um, organizations that are well established uh, along the East Coast and even on the West Coast um, of institutions that study whales. Um, when anything is involved with um, what goes on in the ocean or washes up on the beach. Aquariums are often the first place people think, well, let's see what the aquarium says about that or how does the aquarium going to respond? And um, that was the process in the early stages of my career when there was no specialized organizations or facilities to keep animals that might have been washed up on the on the shoreline or, or whatever. And so I was one of the people that would respond to that. And we even kept a baby seal in our home. And my, my wife, my wife raised it up for over five weeks, feeding it baby bottles, five human baby bottles per feeding of this um uh, heavy cream and powdered cottage cheese and vitamins and getting that into this baby seal five times per day. Immense amount of work that um, she would, she did and we kept the animal in our bathtub and it was just an experience that no one today could uh, enjoy because everything is so specialized where there are stranding um, facilities to, that focus on that. Wow. So, so it was, it's been great. Did you, did your wife know what she was getting into when she started dating you? <laughs> that is a good question. I don't Every know, but I ask it, a good it, question. It, it worked, it worked out. Um, uh, she was very, um, supportive and understanding and her, as I said, she had an experience that no one else had. It wasn't my experience. It was hers. She did all the work and I just brought it home and happened to be my son PJ's 10th birthday. So I came home with a baby seal and that was better than a clown or a, a bouncy house for her birthday. So memories, it was, it was amazing. Good memories. Good memories. And. Yeah, I, I can imagine just the wife and and the and the and the kids just, you know, did, they they probably love going to work with you, and you, you take your take your kids to work day. Yeah, it was all it was all fun. We had we had a lot of good times. Excellent, and the work at the the Gotham Whale again, where you're the executive sure. director. Sure. What are, how is that impacting? the public's awareness of not only the whales themselves, but also this migration as I'm becoming aware and again, reading the book, you know, big whale, big city, which we're going to get into next. How is this, the, the work of the Gotham whale, uh, how is that helping to increase our awareness of what is actually happening out of the open water well, and around New York of, city? One of the things about New York city. It's really a, the, the media capital of probably the world. And, um, <laughs> just like shark, shark attacks, right. <laughs> the media follow each other and there's a media frenzy. So Gotham Whale has been very fortunate to get a lot of, um, exposure and we bring that message of, wow, look at this, the return of whales to New York city. Whales in the foreground, uh, skyscrapers in the background of, of whales uh, that had been away from New York waters for 
uh, many, many, many years. And uh, to see them return is uh, really spectacular. So we, we tell that story and we're happy that it's a good news story. So many environmental projects and, and environmental issues uh, kind of stress the doom and gloom of things. Our story is one of rebirth around the waters of New York. So um, it's a nice story to tell. I, uh, I modeled the thought process of developing Got the Whale very much along the lines of, as I said, institutions that now exist um, up in the Northeast and on the West Coast where whales um, are abundant. <clears throat> no one did it in New York because the whales weren't here. <laughs> and <clears throat> this, this one organization, Presley, out on the East end of uh, New York, but uh, that's not in the city environment. So when I saw that the whales were coming, I said, well, we should do the research that similar to the same kind of research that is done in Massachusetts and Maine. But one of the things that we do is we incorporate uh, citizen science where we ask regular citizens, number one, to give us many grants to pay for the whale watch trip, which gives us a platform to go out and take photographs, to take the data, to uh, take the latitude and longitude, uh, identify the animals individually sometimes, but as species the numbers we see, and we're building maps to understand better where the whales are and when we can expect them to be in certain areas. Okay. You know, our good friend, uh, Chris, uh, Paparo is, you know, he, for our listeners, it was Chris who, uh, was on our last episode in 2021. I believe it was episode, uh, 116 or 3116. Chris introduced me, uh, to Paul and, and by the way, and you're going to see this on the video, there's a big photo as Paul's background. And I'm thinking that looks very similar to a shot Chris might've taken, but is this how you and uh, Chris met was uh, part of this research? It is exactly only okay. it was more from the citizen science um, <clears throat> perspective because Chris is a avid boater and fisherman and undersea aficionado and, and does a lot of photography. And so he's been one of our major contributors of whales, um, that he's out in his boat and he takes some photographs and sends me the data. We compile all this data from all these various sources. And as I say, we're building a, a, a picture with, uh, our research scientist, Danielle Brennan has, uh, turned that into um, uh, scientific publications. And one of the things that I'm learning is that unless something is in a scientific publication, a peer reviewed journal, the information doesn't almost doesn't exist. Right. So for science and conservation, we feel like we're gathering this data, turning it into scientific publications that can be used for science and conservation. And it's a great contribution that our organization uh, provides. That's fantastic. And I, I love the story. And, and by the way, I don't know if I shared this with you when you and I were doing the introductory call is I'm a very opportunistic podcaster. So I am definitely going to get out to New York, not only to see uh, Chris, but to see you and get out on the boat because I've never seen a whale. And well, I want to come take care on of that. down, come will... on down because the picture like this, this one didn't happen to be taken by Chris. It was taken by our photographer, Artie Raslich, that does wonderful work. But, um, this site is fairly common on our whale watch trips. Wow. I, it's called, is... it's called lunge beating when the whales come up through the water, the mouth wide open and engulf these tight bait balls of, uh, fish in this case, men hating. I love it. And one other aspect of my opportunism 
is I would love in addition to the, you know, the, the photo of the copy of the book and your headshot, if there's some photos you could share with us for our show notes, I would welcome that. And so would our listeners. Absolutely. Fantastic. Hey, sure. Well, let's talk about the book now, uh, big whale, big city. When did you get this inkling, this insight? Like, you know, we need to turn this into a children's book. When did that start to come about? Uh, it just kind of dawned on me. I have to say that I was, uh, the story, the backstory is, um, uh, I, my wife was sick for a while and I spent a lot of time just waiting in hospital, waiting rooms and things. And so I just took, uh, some, made some sketches, um, kind of like in a cartoon storyboard form. And I just outlined the story of one particular whale that we are, we know, uh, we call him Jerry and that whale we have seen over and over, um, keeps coming back and it's kind of our favorite whale. And so I made these <laughs> stick figure storyboard and I met some, um, a publisher uh, at a, uh, dive exposition. And I just kind of pitched the storyline using these stick figure drawings for me, which is pretty sad, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess it got the message across. So anyway, it developed. And then I was able to get a, um, an illustrator who was a, a, a whale expert in her own right, uh, Jory Reidenberg who is a human, uh, anatomy teacher at Mount Sinai. She teaches all the doc doctors human anatomy, but she also was very involved in comparative anatomy, uh, looking at other, uh, animals and in particular whales. So she is an excellent illustrator and also a, um, a very knowledgeable person in terms of whale structure and, um, behaviors. Fantastic. Now, I love the fact that you started with the stick figures and as you rightly alluded to, we have to know our own limitations, but <laughs> you kind of hand it off the, to the stick figures to somebody who actually knew what they were doing, the, oh, uh, uh, joy. And how was it like working with her and then coming up with the words in the book is children's books are relatively short. I mean, each page maybe only has a couple of sentences, uh, before it goes on to the next page and the next image. How did you two collaborate and work together? Well, actually we use pretty much what I had, uh, laid out as the storyline and, um, there wasn't much <laughs> it's, it's for a, um, a first grade level. So okay. I was able to handle that. Um, and I worked with the publisher to, uh, be sure that we didn't use any words that were unfamiliar to, uh, very young kids. Um, and so we went through basically just the story of what we do using one whale as an example. And so it begins with the whale, uh, being born in tropical waters. Some people don't realize that the whales, uh, go to warmer waters in order to breed and give birth. I always say that they are very intelligent animals and they know enough to go south for the winter. Yes, that, <laughs> there is that, there is that. So, um, I, I just kind of walked through the story of the, the, the young whale, baby whale staying with its mother, being instructed by its mother, and then making the journey, which normally would go right past New York and up into Maine and the Gulf of Maine and further up into colder waters up north. But this whale had a sense of curiosity and took a left turn and went into the area where he saw, um, skyscrapers. And so that made the story. And then mixed in with that, I tried to use some, um, 
informative and interesting facts about the natural history, how they feed, and some of the uh, natural history uh, <clears throat> descriptions that uh, add a little bit more to the story besides just uh, whale coming to New York. I love it. You know, I'm really curious now, Paul, about Jerry and this journey and his mom just saying goodbye, son, you know, welcome to the world, little guy, uh, goodbye. Uh, right. Would you mind, you know, entertaining us a little bit by reading, uh, some, not, a not bit at from all. I don't know if you have enough, um, um, oh, there it for, is for there the, is. um, and I have to tell you a little bit about the, um, uh, Jerry name. Okay. We have to credit our photographer, Artie Raslich with that because he had a, um, experience, uh, that really produced kind of, uh, something that was iconic to our activity and in the beginning got a lot of information. A okay. lot of attention. Okay. Uh, he was out on his, well, he happens to be a deadhead. Ah, a Jerry. Familiar, dead, <laughs> dead Jerry head. Garcia. All right. Yeah. So he's a, a follower of the Grateful Dead. Right. And he was out on his boat named the Ship of Fools. Okay. Which I guess has a, a Grateful Dead reference. And it happened to be Jerry Garcia's birthday. And he took what we call this iconic shot. Move it uh, over, move it back just a little bit towards you and to the, okay, there oh, you yeah. go, right there. Okay. I well, it's it? a, it's a shot of Jerry spy poppy or kind of coming up and looking around and in the background is the empire state building. Oh, wow. And that just captures the idea of the whale next to the big city and wow. everybody that sees that photograph just goes, whoa. So Jerry Garcia's birthday, spotting that whale, getting that particular shot. There was no other name that we could put on that whale. Would you do me a favor, uh, Paul, would you please ask Artie, say, Artie, I just did the podcast with Howard on the outdoor adventure series. And he would love to include that photo in his show notes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. He's been a great uh, help to Gotham whale and getting attention from with his high quality pictures, like the one behind me. And also the one that is just so captured that big whale, big city, uh, concept. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just hold up a couple of pages here. Okay. But it basically goes along the lines of the whale growing up and saying, um, goodbye, mom. And we have a, a nice illustration of the mom saying goodbye, a little tear in her eye. <laughs> and, and then the mo mother, of course, gives, uh, some watch out for ropes and boats, the mother calls. Watch out for nets and plastic trash. You know, kind of what what the problem is. Watch out for killer whales and sharks. So little warnings as he goes out on his own and makes the explorations that bring him into New York, the big city. Excellent. Excellent. What has been the reaction, Paul, to the book? I know it was just recently published at the end of, uh, last year in November timeframe. What's been the reaction? Um, people really like, like it. I'm, I'm very proud to say that, um, anyone that's given us a review has given us like five stars and, um, and, and in particular, some of the uh, people that have purchased this book are teachers and they say, this is just great. We can use this in our uh, class experience because we talk about how the whales feed, um, how they, uh, lunge feed, 
fact that we use this identification, which is just like fingerprints that humans use for individual identification markings. Sure. And so all of that comes out in the book and teachers uh, can use this uh, in their classrooms. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually thinking as you're sharing that book, I, I have my niece, my two nieces have very young children. I, I think there's going to be two books uh, on the way. They don't see Uncle Howard very often. So, uh, or great Uncle Howard. So well, I think, I think that, they would like it. I think they would like it too. You know, as you look back at your career, I mean, wow. I mean, you've just been able to really pursue your passion and thank you, Jacques Cousteau, uh, for being there when you were young. Thank, and I can thank him too, because, you know, just always being fascinated by the undersea world. And, but as you look back on your career, any aha moments that like, wow, can't believe this is happening. Um, and one thing I do want to make a point about is that Jacques Cousteau wrote the book, the silent world. Yeah. And now we are finding out scientists are uh, putting down the kind of equipment that wasn't available in Chuck Stone's time. Uh, and they're finding that it is not silent. It's hugely, um, filled with, with, with sounds. And one of the things that I explored a little bit, haven't proved it yet, but we explored it was how do the whales know where the fish are? They go directly to these bait balls and they come up through the bait ball. They can't see it because the water is, um, so, uh, full of, uh, algae and, uh, it's kind of cloudy environment visibility is maybe 10 feet at most around new England and around New York. Uh, so they can't use sight and they can't, uh, the big whales don't have echolocation the same way that the toothed whales do. So they have to rule those things out. So it comes to my mind that maybe the, the fish are making some kind of sound that the whales are hearing and picking up. Now there's also smell. That's a possibility, but, um, when the whales go underwater, they close off their nostrils. So how they would take in any kind of uh, signal from a smell, um, uh, is difficult to imagine, but maybe we just haven't found it out yet. So it was all that kind of thing that is, uh, going on. And that was, that was one aha moment that I had that I saw these whales swim in a, what I would call a beeline to the school. So they know somehow how to find the fish, sound, smell, not sight, they have to rule out sight. So, um, anyway, that was kind of a, uh, interesting thing. You know, I would much rather spend my tax dollars and research that very question than to have my tax dollars spent on a couple other activities that are not so nice. I understand. <laughs> Before we go, Paul, uh, one last thing, you know, I love what I love about the outdoor adventure series is people are coming from a variety of backgrounds. They have skills, expertise, interest, and you came from a very scientific exploration research uh, area to explore the undersea and every, in the various, uh, animals that are, that are underseas. As you kind of, again, look back in your career and, you know, I'm sure people have asked you for advice in the past. Like, how would you do this? What would you do, Paul? What are your suggestions? What would be at insight to go that you would like to leave our listeners with on this episode of the outdoor adventure series. Sure. Um, I think it still applies. Um, even in, you know, my beginning career was 1969. Um, but, uh, I think, I think the approach still applies. 
I was able to get my foot in the door and then do a good job to progress through the ranks and make it up to a very uh, satisfying career. Um, I tell young people to do the same. I, I was interviewed, um, um, uh, and, and wrote back, it was a magazine interview and I wrote the uh, answer to a very similar question. And I said, um, take every task and do it with excellence Add a flair if you can, and then pick up the heavy end. So I, somebody showed that to me, uh, years after I wrote it and they said, I didn't remember writing it. And I said, that's great. Who wrote that? <laughs> and they, they said, you did. Wow. So that, that's gotta be pretty special when somebody, you know, could be a, a guest in the aquarium you worked with and. You know, somebody from your past comes back to you and, you know, lets you know the impact you've had on them. I very much appreciate that. I just had a uh, birthday party and some of my colleagues from the New England Aquarium, because I happen to be in Boston at this moment, uh, where my family is and I had a birthday party and the, uh, people from the aquarium that I actually hired back in, back in the day, they came to that birthday and, uh, and they actually did say that they were pleased that I hired them and they enjoyed the experience. So that was very heartwarming to me. That's fantastic. Paul, we really appreciate you joining us on the outdoor adventure series podcast and sharing your background, you know, the career, the work you're doing with the Gotham whale. Uh, nonprofit. And of course, you know, congratulations on the book, Big Whale, Big City. And once again, I'm an opportunistic guy. You're going to see me sometime next year, or maybe this I, year, who I knows, but you will see me. I, and I, and I should really thank because Gotham Whale is an all volunteer, um, organization and everybody does all the functions and I give a shout out to Bonnie Crawford, who was the person that, uh, reminded me that you're the one that said that <laughs> pick up the heavy end. That's that'll, that'll advance your career. I think in whatever field you happen to approach it with. Fantastic. Before we actually head out, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work at Gotham whale or any social sites, where are the best places for them to go? Well, we have a website, um, that's, uh, got them whale.org. Okay. Uh, and we also are very active, all of whom, um, are all of the programs are managed by volunteers from Gotham whale, but we have a, um, Gotham whale, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter account. Okay. Uh, that is quite active and we show kind of current activities that got the whales involved in. Fantastic. Well, we will definitely provide the backlinks to the website and to all of the social sites, uh, as well as a link back to the book. So folks can pick it up, say like on Amazon and wherever, or some of the other, uh, uh, book platforms, but really Paul, I want to thank you for joining us today on the outdoor adventure series podcast. I want to thank again. Uh, Chris Paparo for making the introduction for us. We appreciate him and uh, just a wonderful episode. And you have me excited. I'm going to actually get something checked off my bucket list. Well, I, I really hope I will see you in New York and uh, we'll, we could show you Gotham Whale in action. So okay. it's a pleasure talking with you, Howard. Fantastic. Paul, stay on the line. We're going to do a quick close and then we can chat a little bit more. Okay. Sure thing. Well, listen, we have just been chatting with Paul C. He's the executive director of Gotham Whale and the author of the wonderful children's book, Big Whale, Big City. It was just published this past November and the uh, really wonderful, uh, you know, book itself, fantastic illustrations from uh, Joy uh, Riedenberg. 
And we actually have uh, really some of the insights and what went into some of the imagery themselves based on some photography uh, from one of the photographers, uh, Artie, who is associated uh, with Gotham Whale. What a wonderful bit of information and insight and education and really kind of learning more about not only Paul's work, it is his passion for the undersea and, and kind of hearing from him that, you know, listening and watching Jacques Cousteau uh, when he was growing up had that kind of impact that propelled him into the career he has had. And now even in his retirement, he's continuing to make a difference uh, as the executive director, along with all of the, 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 uh, the uh, participants in this volunteer-based organization to really educate and contribute uh, to our knowledge about whales and their migration, uh, especially the humpback uh, that whale that is make that they're making their way back up uh, from their birthing uh, spots and you know perhaps in, in South America uh, all the way up now into uh, the Northeast, uh, New York City and beyond. We hope you enjoyed uh, today's episode. Do let us know uh, yeah they're on our websites six uh, outdoor adventure series. Uh, dot com. Uh, we are also on Facebook and on LinkedIn on the Outdoor Adventure Series pages, and we are on all of the podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Spotify, and a host of other um, podcast directories. And, you know, if you enjoyed the episode, again, let us know, share it with your friends and family. Do check out uh, the, the, uh, website and some great merch out there. I'm going to go out and I'm going to get myself a, no, a nice, uh, long sleeve t-shirt, uh, because that's what I love to wear. Uh, but do go out to gothamwhale.org. And again, we're going to provide the back links, uh, to all of the social sites as well. We're also going to provide a back link to my friend, Chris Paparo's episode, uh, that we recorded last year. And I met Chris uh, via the Outdoor Writers Association of America. We're going to provide a backlink to it as well. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. Take care of yourselves, your family, the community. Get involved locally, you know, wh wherever you can. Get out to nature and help take care of the environment, uh, whether it's on land or on the water, because that's all we have. And imagine the gifts we will then be able to leave with our kids and grandkids and great grandkids and beyond. Okay, folks, we'll see you on, on another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now.